I worked in-house as a UX designer at a tech company in Austin, Texas. So I made great money. I wasn't making six figures yet, but I was making good money. So I finally hit that mark about four months in and I was like, okay, I did it. But then I looked around at my life and I realized I just worked a 13 hour day and it felt like someone took my brain out of my head scrambled it and put it back in. And that's how I felt at the end of the day. And it wasn't just that day. It was the day before that and the day before that and the day before that. Hey, Feasters, and welcome to episode 11, the final episode of season three of Living the Feast. Aw, I know, it's a sad panda day. And as I tell my son, though, you'll be all right. We'll be back in just four weeks with a brand new season all about niching down. Now on to today's show. Avani Miriala is a freelancer in Texas and she's absolutely killing it. She's a UX designer who's got an amazing podcast as well. Like myself, she's learning out loud where she shares all the things that are working and not working for her business. She's built out systems in her business so that she can work smarter and live her life, which we'll dive into. If you're new to the show, I'm Jason Resnick, and Live in the Feast is a podcast for freelancers like you looking to build a profitable business and get recurring revenue, ultimately, so that you can live the life of your own design. If you aren't new to the show and you enjoy what we do here, Well, why not head on over to iTunes and click on that subscribe button so that you get notified as soon as a brand new episode drops. In this episode, Avani is super brilliant. She shares how she's empathetic to her clients and then turns that around by solving their problems through UX. She also shares her wisdom about choosing your own path by working on something making an impact, and then it's okay to say, okay, I'm done with that. Now let's start something new, which is why she's created the six-figure freelance roadmap. Now I'll shut up and let her dive into all that. This episode is brought to you by Feast, the premium online coaching and community designed for web developers, designers, marketers, and freelancers of all type wanting to specialize their business and build recurring revenue that's profitable and sustainable. Today's market is ever-changing, and yesterday's advice won't cut it. Feast members get access to the roadmap and training library, which includes everything you need to niche down, build recurring revenue, and become that go-to respected person for your services. That, together with monthly roundup calls, exclusive workshops, expert chit chats and our slack community you'll have everything you need to live the life of your own design if you're serious about not competing on price and having clients that respect you and your expertise then join feast head over to feastcourse.com today Hey, Feasters. Welcome to Live in the Feast. Today, I have Avani Miriala here. Welcome, Avani. Thank you, Jason. I'm so happy to be here today. Awesome. I'm glad to have you here. She's a designer, an entrepreneur, an educator. She helps folks, in her words, break out of society's rut. And I love that because that's what <laughs> I'm about. You guys know that's what I'm about. She's also a podcast host, and it's called Beyond the Status Quo. Definitely go give that a listen. It's a stellar podcast. Avani, I'm sure I didn't do justice to that intro. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about who you are and why you do what you do? Absolutely. So I'm so happy to be here today, like I said earlier, and my name is Avani Mariella. I am a UX designer by trade. Like That is my profession. I still call myself a designer, but 
I actually decided to jump out of in-house designing and start my own design consultancy last year. And so that's what I do now. I'm running a consultancy full time and it's actually grown into <laughs> quite a consultancy practice, which is super exciting to see how it's been scaling and growing. So I've learned so much throughout that process. But along with that, as I've been growing and learning, I needed to share my thoughts, what I was learning every single day with other freelancers. Because I know that if I'm having massive breakthroughs, other people could be learning from that, or I could at least be documenting it somewhere. So that's kind of why I started the podcast. With that, a course came along as well. I post a lot on Instagram, Instagram stories about what I'm doing, what I'm up to. And I'm all about the ability to work smart rather than work hard. So work smart, produce good quality work, and also live your life because most of us, we spend so much of our lives in an office, in a cubicle, and that's not what humans were meant to do. Right. Humans were meant to explore, to see the world, to have social experiences, and like that's what our lives should be. So I'm so passionate about helping people have more of that and less of the cubicle life. I always say that I'm allergic to mediocrity, and that's what I truly stand by and hope to spread that, spread that d- disease to <laughs> other people. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. And that's where we connected was on Instagram. I just was kind of clicking through Instagram one time, sitting on the couch. That's usually where I click through Instagram, (laughs) right? And I came across your stories and the first was the podcast. And that that title for me, you know, that resonated right away. I was just like, okay, beyond the status quo, I got to check this out, right? But as I looked at your profile there and started following your stories, I know you just came back from a trip. I mean, you'd love to travel. So I'm excited to bring you onto the show because, I mean, that's what we're all about as freelancers and business owners and consultants. We try to live a life that we design, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's actually super easy. It's strange, but it's easy to forget why you stepped into this life, why you started going against the grain. Because when you start a consulting practice or you become a freelancer, you need to hustle because you tell yourself, you need to hustle. I need to make the money to, you know, one, prove to myself that I did the right thing by leaving my traditional career. And I totally get that. But then for me, when I was doing that, I was, I think it was like month three or four into this and I was working really hard and I was finally reaching my income to match my income at a, I worked in-house as a UX designer at a tech company in Austin, Texas. So Mm. I made great money. I wasn't making six figures yet, but I was making good money. So I finally hit that mark about four months in and I was like, okay, I did it. But then I looked around at my life and I realized I just worked a 13 hour day and it felt like someone took my brain out of my head, scrambled it and put it back in. And that's how I felt at the end of the day. And it wasn't just that day. It was the day before that and the day before that and the day before that. So that was where I was like, this isn't right. This is not why I left my job. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I I get it. I mean, I've been there myself, you know, uh, working full time for a long time and alongside that doing the freelance stuff. And it got to a point where it was like I was working as much in the in the cube as out of the cube. And I was like (laughs) sleeping like three or four hours. I was like, okay, well, this is the tipping point, maybe. Right. Absolutely. I'm curious. And and I ask everybody the same question. What's your defining moment in life so far? So I'm I'm young. I'm still in my mid 20s, so I have a lot of life left to live. I'm mm-hmm. sure I'll have a lot of defining moments sure. coming up in my life. But for me definitely it was making the jump to leave my job. I had worked in the industry for about 5 years at that time, so it was about leaving my job at a wonderful tech company, at a dream job for most people. This is a position that most people would have been so happy to have. Mm-hmm. So happy to have. So leaving that really, really, really good opportunity and going to something that could be amazing, but it was a could be. So there was a great amount of uncertainty there, but I did it anyway. I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I really did it. (laughs) But for that, taking that leap of faith, it was a defining moment for me because it was the first time that I 
it, I don't know. It was almost like I was jumping off a plane and believing that my parachute was going <laughs> to save me. <laughs> and it was the first time that I did that. I was free falling for a while, but it all worked out and I'm still alive. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. That was for me the most defining moment. And to add on to that, it wasn't just that I left a job because a lot of us can do that, but it was also the fact that I left this identity that I had created for myself or this life that I thought I was going to live. Mm. And it was because I was already on this train track. I was on this train and we were going to climb the corporate ladder and, you know, go from associate designer to designer to senior designer to director to creative, whatever, to senior creative director, right. VP. That was the path. And I was on that train and I had Basically, I had these ideas for what my life should be like, but I finally, for the first time when I made this leap, I sat back and I thought like, is it just because it should be that way because of society doesn't mean my life should be that way because that's not necessarily what I want, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, it, it's funny. I just had in this same season, I had a, a conversation with Philip Van Dusen. And he talked about instead of your career path being like a ladder, more like a spider web, because you do take rights and lefts and, and you still kind of climb to some degree. But at the same time, just because what you start out as doesn't define you, right? He goes on and he talks about how he was class, he was classically trained as a painter. Right. And he went different routes. He was a designer. Now he's a brand strategist. He's a YouTuber. Like he's all, you know, he, <laughs> and he's had a wonderful career doing all that stuff. And until I had that conversation, I never really internalized that myself just to know that like at a very early on, you know, I was in my early teens and I was just, I was a stock boy and I hated the job and I was working at a fabric store. So what 14 year old boy wants to work at a fabric store, right? Like that's just not cool, right? So I, at an early on, I realized that like, I didn't want to work at a job that I hated, right? And like, I was like, I, I know where I want to kind of be with my life, at least in that regard. And looking back on it now, it was kind of weird how like I had those thoughts in my head such so early on, but Mm -hmm. You know, and I didn't come from an entrepreneurial family either. So like my father and my mother, they kind of went that traditional route. And, and I was just like, I knew even when I went to college and, you know, I had battles with my mom because that was at the Silicon Valley explosion. And I was like, I'm yeah. leaving college. I'm going out West. <laughs> and she was like, you are not. You're getting that piece of paper you're getting your ticket. And, and all these things. But like, I always knew that eventually I couldn't sit at somebody else's desk because that mm -hmm. wasn't the life that I wanted. I wanted a life where, you know, I was able to have the freedom and flexibility of my own time, right? To be able yeah. to spend time with my family, which at that point I wasn't even ready for one, right? Like I wasn't even right. thinking of having a kid or anything like that. But now that I do, I've been doing this thing for a decade now. And, you know, it's great because it's, it allows you to shift and live life because we only have one go at it. And to have that linear path and that should path, like, okay, maybe this should be the way it goes, but I don't want it that way. Yeah. No matter what you think, the power is in our hands to make that decision and to change. And, but it, sometimes I think it feels like it's not. <laughs> sure. The other thing I wanted to make a note on based on what you were just saying, you're talking about this idea that a career can be a spider web rather than a ladder. It's interesting because I think a lot of us, especially early on, we feel that because we chose one path, we have to go down that path. And I don't know why. Maybe that's just the story. That's the story that we are told. That's the story we're told. Like you get a, get a great education. You have to major in the thing that you're going to be working on for the next 40 years of your life. 40 years is a long time. <laughs> sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think that that's another story that we get to rewrite if we choose to. And we don't have to do what the one thing, even like the thing I'm doing right now, I don't have to do it the rest of my life either. I probably won't be doing it the rest of my life. And I think that's the most exciting part is that you can start something, pick it up, be an expert, make an impact, and then decide, okay, now it's time for me to start something new. And that's, that's thrilling to me. Yeah. So take me back to when you had that job that you liked, you enjoyed, 
and you know, your brain was getting all scrambled, but at the same time, like, what was that decision process? Like, did you have somebody that you talked with about this or was this kind of just like an internal battle that you had? I mean, what, Walk me through a little bit about that decision-making of making the leap. So there was a moment at the company I was at, they went through layoffs. And I've been at companies that have gone through layoffs before. But with the layoffs came a new strategy for the company. And I'm a UX designer. I love talking to people, getting ideas from user interviews, understanding like, I would say my superpower is empathy. So I love getting to know what the other person's thinking. What is their world like? Taking that information and solving a problem for them and hopefully innovating, creating a really great new idea to put into a product. So that's what I love. And that's why I decided to join this company. But then as the company pivoted, they were really, really ready to become profitable, which meant less innovation. But that's okay. You know, that's what you have to do as a business. You have to say, okay, where are we going to make the money? Where Maybe we have to work more on marketing and ads. So instead of being an innovative designer who got to spend time talking to people, I essentially became a designer that was working on landing pages and marketing collateral, which I don't mind in general. Like I actually do that now for myself <laughs> <laughs> and it's so much fun. But I don't know, something with that shift, that shift of the company, that shift of my role really didn't sit well with me because I was like, I don't know why, but this isn't fun for me. I don't like that I'm not working on anything impactful right now. I get the why for the business, but I don't get the why for people, like the big picture. And so that didn't feel right to me. So that was kind of the the beginning that initiated this entire thought process. So I, then I started questioning, but I'm not even excited to go to work. So why should I go to work? What am I doing? And then there was, you know, people like my manager. I had a wonderful manager. He helped me become a great designer, become a great collaborator. But then suddenly I was like, he's telling me what to do. I don't think what he's telling me is the right thing. <laughs> I had this all this dialogue going on through my head. So I started feeling like, you know what? I'm ready to call the shot. I'm ready to sit at the table. And at that time, I wasn't seeing seeing the path forward that I wanted to anymore. I wasn't having big, meaty problems to sink my teeth into and figure out. So I was like, you know what? It's time for a change. I am not here to stop learning. Learning curve had plateaued. And that was a big no, no, no for me. So as soon as that happened, as soon as I felt that stagnancy, I needed to do something else. So that was a thought process that I went through a little bit. But then... I needed to get advice on what to do because I was like, maybe I should get another job. That was my first thought. Right. Maybe I could join a consultancy. I've never worked with a consultancy before. So I started talking to people. I had dozens of conversations with people in the industry, in my town, people not in my town, people who I'd worked with previously. I talked to a bunch of freelancers who are already freelancing or who had done that before. So I was getting all this advice basically to do my research as a UX designer. Sure, sure. <laughs> That's what I do. So I did that. I talked to so many different people. And then at the end of the day, I looked inward. I think when that, when that transition of that layoff happened, I knew, I kind of knew inside of me that my time there was done. I don't know. I had a feeling. But so in the back of my, my mind, I knew something was going to change soon. And then I wanted to be an entrepreneur anyway. My parents are entrepreneurs. I saw the life that they've lived and it's been a very amazing life and they've set an amazing example for me. So I knew that ultimately I wanted to do that. So then the question was, why not now? Just because I'm young, just because I am scared. <laughs> I don't know that like there are so many like thought processes that go through our head. The thing that changed was I saw a friend of mine. She was a year older than me. She had already been one year into her marketing consultancy. She actually runs a company called Good Juju. And she was running a very successful business operation. And I looked at her and I really admired her. She's smart. We got along very well. I saw that if she could do it, I could do it. And so after that, I was like, you know what? It's done. It's just going to happen. I made the leap. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the story. And I do want to make one note. There was actually an interesting book that I read called The Big Leap. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of it? Yep. I think it's by Gay Hendricks, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I don't know the author. I know the book. 
Yeah, yeah. It's the picture. There's a picture of a fish like mm-hmm. jumping from a. <laughs> so that book, that book was amazing because it helped me identify what are my upper limits right now. What is stopping me from being and living in my zone of genius? Because I was in my zone of excellence for for a while, and if I wanted to move and live life beyond the status quo, I needed to move into the zone of genius, and I wanted the space to figure that out. And I know this is kind of a long-winded answer to your question, but the other reason that I wanted to do this was because I had all these ideas of things I could do. Like I wanted to write more. I wanted to create more. I truly wasn't feeling creative as I thought I would as a designer in the professional field as much anymore because I wasn't innovating, remember? So I needed to get back to that feeling of creativity as a creative individual, as someone who's always liked making things for my entire life, I needed to get back to that. So those were kind of the driving factors that helped me make the leap. That was the decision process that I went through. It. So it wasn't overnight. Sure. It took a few months. But when I did it, I knew it was the right thing. 110%, I knew it was the right thing. Awesome. So how did you get over those, some of the fears then? Like, I mean, you made the leap, right? And you said that you had some fears of, you know, well, you were young. How did you kind of get out of your own head there and say, okay, you know what? I'm just pushing those aside, those fears (laughs) aside, and I'm moving forward. Yeah. I actually had some of the fears that cropped up because of things other people told me too, which was interesting that, oh, you've seen early success. Like I had probably a client or two at that time. I was like, you know, I've been doing this. I can just figure it out. So they're like, oh, you've seen early success. This is, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. So it was this feeling of maybe I was incompetent. Maybe I was just lucky. Maybe I was too young or too inexperienced, too whatever. So those were all the fears that were popping up in my head. I would think about this and I would talk about it. And I actually spoke frequently about it to my fiance, but he's an entrepreneur. He's, he's a serial entrepreneur and he's working on a second business right now. So it was one thing that he told me that helped me so much. I actually posted about this recently on Instagram, but he told me that a bird does not rely on the branch it's sitting on in order to keep it up. It relies on its wings in case the branch breaks. Hmm. I like that. The bird isn't relying on the strength of the branch, but rather the strength of its own wings that it's, you know, it's flown around before. It flies for a living. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it flies for a living. Why wouldn't the wings not work one day? You know, why would they stop working randomly? It's very, very unlikely, right? So taking that analogy and applying it to myself, I realized that I actually do have a great skill set. I'm not the best in the world by no means. I can get that better. I've already added so much value. I've helped companies grow. I've helped companies build better products. I've helped companies make more money because of my product design. So I had to remind myself of my past successes. And it was a matter of, I would say, building up my confidence and giving myself little pep talks, reminding myself how much good that I've already done and how much good I have left to do. To break those, I would say, they were limiting beliefs. To break those limiting beliefs. And then the other thing is I look on social media, and, and sometimes it's bad to do this, but, you know, comparison is not, typically not our friends. But I was looking on social media, and I was seeing people younger than me and more inexperienced than me doing what I wanted to do. They were super successful. They were living the life I wanted to live. And I... I saw that and I asked myself if they can do it, I can definitely do it because I, and I would do it with much better design. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. So, so it was a compilation of a few things that helped me break through those limiting beliefs. And, you know, they're not gone forever. They still show up in my life today, but I think it's a daily practice. So it's a regular practice of reminding yourself where your zone of genius is, reminding yourself the work you have left to do. And now what helps me a lot to break through those limiting beliefs is to take myself out of my little bubble. So that means take the eyes off myself and put them on other people. Because for me now, it's how can I impact these companies that have great missions and I'm going to be their 
UX strategy and design arm? How can I impact those people? How can I do better for these those people? How can I help more of those people? Or for my educational side of my business, how can I help one more person leave their job and be able to travel and work from anywhere? And that those things light me up and those things keep me going so that now all these fears that I had, they're so insignificant because they don't, they're, they're nothing compared to the big impact that could be made if I just let them fall away to the side. Sure. No, that's awesome. I like that, that bird analogy too, because it's betting on yourself is what it really means. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think a lot of us have in us as business owners and freelancers and such, we bet on ourselves, but then we're humans too. We're like, okay, there's times <laughs> where we wake up in the morning and we're just not as motivated as we could be, you know, or not as like, I don't know, this day, oh, can I just go back to bed? I don't feel it today, you know, and not inspired <laughs> enough or whatever it is, but you have to realize, look, you're betting on yourself. You're doing good. You know, you have good relationships with your clients, with your colleagues, friends, family, all of that stuff is there. So just to be able to keep that mindset. And, and I don't know about you, but I hear a lot of freelancers when I engage with them, sometimes they get lost in their own silo. Hmm. They feel isolated. They feel, which is horrible as a human being, right? We talked, you talked earlier about sitting in a cube. That's not natural. Well, it's not natural either. We're social beings on this planet, right? So to sit in your silo all the time, we could be introverts. A lot of freelancers are. Uh, a lot of developers are. A lot of designers are. And they'd much rather sit behind that screen. But that could be a detriment too. You kind of have to get out there a little bit and meet and talk with people and travel the world, yeah. see the places. I mean, you, ju you just went to the other side of the planet, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was so awesome. The, I, you know, I saw the photos and such and looked like a great time. I mean, that's something that I want to do. I want to go over to Europe and kind of spend a month over there and you know, now we have a one-year-old. I don't know if that's possible now, but <laughs> we'll see. But, you know, just to be able to do that stuff, I mean, you have to put those limited beliefs aside and keep going through. It's a lot of mental work. It's a lot of reading books, a little bit of journaling. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You do journal too? Yes. Okay. I have a morning routine. I like to call it my mind gym routine every morning. I've actually broken out of it the last week and a half since we've been traveling, but I view that as a good thing and I'll tell you why in a moment. But what I do in the morning is I'll have my workout, which is a great way to start the day. Then I will eat whatever I need to eat. I'll make my tea and then I'll sit down and for at least 20 minutes is just quiet time. I'm going to do a 10 minute meditation. I'm going to do a journaling exercise. I just do a three-page brain dump. So whatever's in my brain, like things that are bubbling in our brains <laughs> that are just on our minds, whatever, write it down. It's almost like my hand keeps going and my brain is just pouring out onto the pages and I'm just releasing whatever's in my mind so that I have a clear mind to then later on get to my work and be ready, ready to sit down and do that. And the reason I took a break recently was I actually did over 200 days in a row of this routine. And uh, it was great. I think it did a lot to me in a great way. But then I also felt maybe it was getting a little stale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, maybe it's me, just me. I'm sure probably other people experience this too. So I needed to take that break to reset. And I think as a creative person, we like to have variety too. And we don't have like to be rigid or stuck. <laughs> sure. So so then I broke out of that for my vacation. I meditated here and there, didn't journal too much. But now I'm back and doing that again. And so much more effective. It feels great. And I, I recommend it for everyone. I haven't done journaling, but I'm not much of a writer either. I have to have that like quiet time in, in the beginning every day just to be able to have a cup of coffee, sit by myself, think about what just what's going on in my head, especially waking up. The creative juices are there, like the ideas just to reflect back on yesterday, be like, why, what was I, th why did I think at 9 p.m. <laughs> that was a good idea? That's just not a good idea. Let's get rid of that thing. Right. But like just to be able to do that stuff. So. You have this six-figure freelancer roadmap, right? Walk me through what that is a little bit about, is it going from the full-time job to a six-figure freelancer? Is it as you 
Are you stuck and you wonder how to get to six figures? What does that roadmap look like? It would be a great roadmap for both of those people that you've just described, but I'll tell you who it's primarily for. So it is for the individual who is a freelancer who is just feeling really stuck in this. It's almost like what you always talk about, this idea of having either a feast or a famine. And, you know, either I have zero clients or I have two clients and three clients, and then I can't get seem to get past a certain number or a certain number of clients in my business. And you're almost feeling stuck in this place because as an individual, we only have a certain amount of capacity every day. So this roadmap, it's a five phase roadmap. It's called the six figure freelance roadmap. And it's a five phase roadmap to help that person who feels a little stuck, exasperated, exhausted about of being in that same place for month after month after year after year. This roadmap is for that person to stop stop doing that, stop living their life that way, stop running their business that way, and to level up. Mm. So I'm giving you the five phases that you need to take a look at, go through, and apply to your business, basically. And uh, talk about talk about a lot of different things on there um, from how to get clients all the way to automation in your business because you need to have a plan. If you're going to scale and become a true CEO, you need to have a plan. And when you have six figures, you are, you're a true CEO and you need to take that, you need to assume that role even before that happens in order for that to happen. Mm. So that's what this roadmap outlines. And for me, uh, where I was in my career, it was really important for me I don't know why, to reach six figures. It was, I guess, something people talk about all the time. Sure. It's also good income as a, I would say, um, an individual who I'm not married yet, but I'm engaged. I don't have any kids. So it's a very comfortable place to be, uh, to make six figures. So that was kind of my first little milestone that I needed to hit. And I was thinking, okay, that was a milestone for me. It must be a milestone for other people. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so that's kind of what I've laid out in this roadmap. And it's not theory. It's exactly what I've done in my business, which is the best part. Like I love opening up the veil, like opening sure. up and showing you what's under the hood in my business because I want everyone to succeed in freelancing because I think that we'll, be, we'll all be better for it. We'll be better people for it. So that's what the roadmap's all about. Awesome. Yeah. And we'll put the link to that directly into the show notes. You could go grab that. Awesome. Yes. It's free. It's free. <laughs> the thing that I like there was that I'm very actionable too. Like when I write, when I you know talk about things inside a feast, like to be able to put things out online that I've done. Like here, we're not just talking about raw, raw stuff, right? Like, yes, that's part of it. But here's the templates. Here's the how I've set up parts of my business. Here's how I use pipe drive. Here's how I use to do it. Like I'll make videos till, the, you know, till the day's end, right? And because like you said, for me, it's like, I always say the phrase, a rising tide raises all boats, right? And as freelancers, mm -hmm. don't work in a silo, like just share what you learn. You learn from other people. People will learn from you. And that only makes all of us better, right? As a community. Absolutely. So yeah, that's all. That's great. Yeah, definitely go check that out. So I talk a lot about niching down and specializing your business. And, and now I, I come from a development background and right? I'm not a designer. I'd never would claim to be a designer. I'm terrible at it, but I know it looks good, right? Would you talk to your clients and present? your services to your clients from a UX perspective, I get a lot of a lot of pushback sometimes from designers when they say, well, yeah, as a developer, if you're working on an e-commerce store, it's easy enough to sell because you could say, well, you're going to make $10,000 more a month if you do this. And you can equate that nice and easy to the business. From a UX standpoint, Designers seem to say, well, I can't do that. Like I design. So how do I make that into a business asset? Oh, you mean, so designers say they can't niche down basically. Right. They can't choose one. Okay. I think that's completely incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> and I will tell you, I'll tell you why. And I did an entire podcast episode on this. I'm not sure which episode it was, but 
niching down. It's so, so powerful. When you niche down, and I'll, I'll talk about how we can do this as designers in a moment, but when you niche down, you are choosing a narrow area and you're saying, this is my area of focus. I'm going to get more clients in this area. And because I'm getting more clients in this area, I'm going to become an expert. Because when you're in one single line of work, one single industry, you're just going to be in that all the time. You're going to learn about it all the time. You're going to end up doing research for one client and learning about, learning about something really niche in that industry. And then it's going to apply to this other client. Mm -hmm. So it kind of snowballs in that way. And you become an expert by doing that. You can become an expert in a handful of months in that industry if you're really choosing to niche down. And when that happens, since you're an expert, you can start to raise your prices. So I'll give you my example. So I am a user experience designer, but I design apps and websites for companies in the cryptocurrency space and Mm. blockchain technology. So that's the niche when I'm talking about what I do. That's what I'm going after as designer and building my client base. So that's kind of my chosen niche. And I do get incoming clients from other niches, but I will also address that in a moment. I'm going to continue with my example for a second. So I'm a UX designer for the cryptocurrency industry. That means I get to build digital wallets. That means I get to help hedge funds build out their processes as a design strategist. I get to help people who are, and this is kind of technical because the space is technical, but I get to help people um, who are going to become block producers these are people who are overseeing the system of how cryptocurrency works. I get to ha- help them start up. I get to help people build certain websites and landing pages. So when I'm in this industry, I'm learning all these technical terms. I'm becoming an expert. I'm learning how the user experience works in that industry. So now if I have one really great, like now I have several really great companies that I'm working with, this is part of my portfolio. And I say this, I was like, hey, this is my specialty. These are the people I've worked with. And they're big names in the industry. So now this new person who's a potential client, they're going to be like, wow, she must be amazing. If these other companies have worked with her and she's an expert in this space, she's definitely worth that price that she's saying she's worth. Mm -hmm. And I need to work with her. She is my solution to my problems because they know that I'm competent. I worked with these other other companies in the space and they know that they're going to get what they're paying for. Because if these other reputable companies in this industry have used me as their vendor, then this other new company should as well. So that's how I'm able to niche down and still increase my prices. And that's why for me, it's beneficial to niche down because then I can manage fewer clients, but still get paid what I want to get paid. Sure. Basically, my prices, my prices are where I want them to be, even though I might have fewer clients. Sure. It's that proven track record. And because you're in that space, the leads recognize those client names as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. And for me, I've been focusing on this industry, but the funny thing that's happened, I don't know, maybe it's like the law of attraction at work. Hmm. (laughs) But then as I'm focused on this industry, I am attracting clients in this industry because people talk and it's a small industry, sure. which is a benefit. But now I'm getting people coming to me from other places like e-commerce places or um, other industries. And I'm now in this position where I get to be super selective. So I can actually just say no because I have this great clientele in this niche industry that I've chosen. And I can say no if I don't like that product or if I'm not interested in it. I'm not desperate anymore. Because I have this great industry that people are paying me really good money for being an expert UX designer in that field. So I'm in a better position. I have this buying mentality rather than a selling mentality to these clients that are coming at me. And I can say, okay, hey, you know, that's actually not what I do. And you can also put a line like, I do UX design for websites and apps. And I'm doing UI design and some research. And that's where my line ends. I'm not going to go do a brand voice and tone exercise for you because that's not what I do, even though I can. Sure. I'm not going to copyright for you because that's not what I do, even though I can. When I narrow my focus down like that as a designer, then I get to be an expert, focus my brain on those areas and those activities. And now I'm the best at those areas and activities. Yeah, that's great. It's- so that's kind of how I've decided to niche down as a designer. And it's been super, super beneficial to me overall. And I think it's it's been a positive effect on 
inbound client leads as well. It's funny too, because Feast, the membership site, what I talk about all the time on both podcasts online is specialization and niching down. How do you go about doing it? I've done it a couple of different times, three times in my own business to niche down further. But to be able to hear other folks, I always love hearing how other folks have done it for themselves because as a UX designer or strategist, the blockchain kind of <laughs> field is so tactical. What was that like? Hey, you know what? I could do that. Like, why did you, how did you choose such a tactical field as a designer? So it happened by accident. Okay. <laughs> So for me, people around me started to get really interested in cryptocurrency in 2016. My fiance, boyfriend at the time, actually, no, that wasn't, that wasn't what he, he wasn't talking about it yet. It was my dad who was talking about it. And my dad owns a, he has a podcast called Crypto Nights and he interviews people, um, who are doing ICOs or other people who are prominent individuals in the cryptocurrency industry and to teach other people about what crypto is. So he started a podcast and he started talking about it. And I was like, okay, what is this? And I had some money set aside. I was like, maybe I'll buy some Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how it all began. And in 2017, or sorry, 2016, the price was great, <laughs> at least for uh, someone who was buying. So I had that skin in the game. So then I started to learn about the industry on my own. Then my fiance got into the space as well um, last year, 2017. And then, so I was learning from him. My dad was talking about it. My friend was talking about it. I had, I had started to buy a little bit more as diversifying, not just Bitcoin, but Ethereum and uh, Monero and some other things as well. So I had to learn about it because I had skin in the game. So I started, I'm not an academic person when it comes to cryptocurrency. Like I'm not going to sit down and read a white paper because right. that's not how my brain works. <laughs> <True>. <laughs> I am a creative, you guys, but I was like having conversations with people and just asking them a lot of questions. So that's how I kind of built this expertise in this area. I also experienced it because I had to have a hardware wallet to keep my funds safe and not keep them on the exchange. So I'm starting to learn these things about the space. Right. And the, the space is so nascent. So it was kind of as I was just doing normal things that you should be able to do easily, I was getting tripped up and I was like, okay, well, they need me. Right. <laughs> they, need a, they need UX at least. Maybe whether it's me or not, but I chose it for it to be me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I identified that. And I was like, you know, there is a problem that I've seen in something I've used in my day-to-day -day life and I want to go address it now. So that's kind of how I decided to do, go into this niche. And it was great because this is a new industry and not many people are creatives in this industry. Sure. Yeah, so yeah. the fact that the demand is high, but the supply is low, the supply being me as a UX designer with expertise in cryptocurrency. So that's the supply and the demand, all these new companies coming out is so high. That also gives me the ability to raise my price and gives me even more reason to become an expert in this field. Yeah, no, smart, smart for sure. Emerging markets, right? If you yes, plant your flag sure. early, <laughs> you'll be the person, the go-to person for it. So that's awesome. That's great. When I heard that, I'm like, wait a second, that's a, such a technical field. Like <laughs> that's not usually what creatives are attracted to, but that's Surprise. cool. It's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome here. So this has been fantastic. Before I let you go, what does life look like today and you know, in the near future? So that's a great question. I'm working on a lot of exciting things. I'm so thankful to be in this place that I'm, I'm doing that. So I'm actually growing my team. I am still on the hunt for a designer that I'm going to add to my team that's a little bit more, I would say, long, long-term relationship type of designer. So that's one thing that I'm growing my team because my clients are growing and they're growing really fast and I can't keep up with them by myself. So I want to be able to add great talent to my team, grow the team so that it's not just me benefiting from this amazing business. So that's one thing. The other thing is I'm continuing to do the podcast. I'm uh, revamping some things in my course. So I'm going to be launching that again soon to welcome a few new students. And this course is designed to help people go from freelancer to six-figure consultant in 90 days. So I'm giving the framework exactly the exact steps I did to make that 
scale, like basically scale that business to that level. And not just once. I'm not talking about one month where you make $8,333. I'm talking about month after month after month. That's my baby that I'm working on right now. I'm so, so excited about it. I want to help convince more people to quit their jobs. Nice. <laughs> so that's what I want. And, and so that they can travel the world and go to Turkey in the middle of whenever, whenever they feel like it, you know? So um, that's what I'm passionate about. That's what I'm working on right now. Awesome. Super excited about it. Awesome. And we'll add all those links into the show notes, as, as I mentioned earlier. This has been awesome. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. I know I got a ton of value out of it. I know the audience, you guys are going to get a ton of value out of this too. So definitely let us know in the comments, reviews on iTunes and Breaker, go ahead and let us know. And uh, where can folks reach out and say thanks? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, wonderful to be here. And you can reach out to me at... Let's let's talk on Instagram. I love chatting on Instagram. I'm on there all the time. <laughs> so go to at Avani Miriala. That's A-V-A-N-I. M-I-R-I-Y-A-L-A. And I will be there waiting to chat and excited to hear from you guys. All right. Awesome. And until next time, it's your time to live in the feast. Thank you so much for listening to today. If you enjoyed this episode, then head on over to liveinthefeast.com and subscribe. Leave Avani and I a five-star rating and review in iTunes as well, as it's going to help others find this episode. Next week, well, since this is the last episode of the season, I'll be back with something super special for you that you'll not want to miss. Until next time, it's your time to live in the feast. Feast.